Um, we, as Pastor Tim said, we've been travelling around a bit. Uh, sunny coast and Fraser coast. So we're going to be turning to the Bible right now. And um, I want to talk a little bit about um, this time in which we now live. Because uh, generations come and go and society alters from time to time. But how does it affect the church? How does it affect the, the kingdom of God? Whichever way we want to word it. Uh, I want to start off in the book of Esther. Okay. Esther in uh, chapter 4. And we'll just start reading in verse 30. And a lot of us know this story rather well, where uh, Esther has become the queen uh, and uh, the bride of uh, the king of Persia at the time. The Chi, uh, and she has... Um, um, and there's an evil man there, Haman, who wants to kill all the Jews. And uh, we see there that Esther's in a, in a situation where she could change things because uh, she is now the queen of Persia. And uh, her, her, well, it's a cousin, actually, Mordecai, the godly man. And he's brought this situation to her. Look, if you don't do something about it, we're all going to go down. And uh, don't think just because you're the queen that you won't go down, because once they find out you're a Jew, well, then uh, you'll be in trouble. I, I dare say, when I think of our recent history, uh, over particularly the last century or so, particularly with this sort of thing, uh, nothing's changed, has it, for the Jews I'm talking about. So now, just let's uh, read a bit of this. <clears throat> we'll just start in verse 13. Then Mordecai com commanded to answer Esther, think not with with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house will be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for, a such, a, for such a time as this? Um, I dare say he said, you're in a position uh, that... Um, could change this, but he said, um, don't ever sort of think, oh, well, that'll be, they'll, they'll be affected out there, but I'll be okay. And of course, Esther then uh, asked them to pray with her, and we know that uh, through Esther, there was an incredible deliverance. My thought, bring it up to date, is that we want to make sure that we're walking and doing what the Lord wants us to do. And maybe we could say about ourselves, for such a time as this, we're here. Um, our society, as I said, changes from time to time. When I came to the Lord, which is a long time ago now, 63 years ago, when I was 17 years old, you know, it was a society that was vastly different to what it is now. And when we had people come to the Lord, often it would be mum and dad and the kids and so on. But as the decades ticked by, particularly the 70s and the 80s, we started converting young people individually. And uh, we had the hippies and the, the, uh, the druggies and the surfies and all those people. But we had a great revival amongst those people because they were looking for the answer. Although it wasn't cool to actually find the answer, you should always keep looking for it. But fortunately, some people did find the answer in the Lord. And then, as I said, society moves on. And um, in uh, recent times, we see that uh, that sort of lifestyle for many young people had, uh, had moved on. And now they still catch waves down on your beautiful beach here, but normally sitting on the beach is their suit in a bag. So after they've caught the waves, they go to work instead of living in their microbus and smelling flowers and living on drugs. So, um, so but our society has become very... Uh, very blessed. In, I'm talking about the Western world, and almost like there's no such thing as poor or middle class. Most people live in upper middle class, whatever you want to call it. Life is good. For the kingdom of God, that's not so good, because the, you might say the more people are happy, they don't look for the Lord. But as I said, I think in recent times, I dare say starting particularly with COVID, and uh, that affecting the whole planet and, every, and everywhere, and then, of course, recently, this uh, horrible war in Europe between Russia and the Ukraine. And people 
I, I believe, are starting to think a little bit more about God and think about maybe that is the answer. Um, let's go to another scripture. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 3. Well known part of the Bible, even though, as you know, have a pretty famous song uh, on the charts years ago. Uh, for In verse 1, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And it goes through all different alternatives. I just want to drop down to verse 7 where it says, A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And I just sort of believe that God has called upon us that this time in which we live is not a time to go silent. It's not a time to, to not talk about the things of the Lord. The Lord is saying, hey, this is a time. Recognize the time that you're in. And that you've got the, for those of us that have become born again Christians, then you, you know that you've got something you never had before you got saved. And by the way, when we're talking about being saved, the Bible is particularly uh, in detail, should I say, the way we get saved. It starts off, I dare say, with somebody talking to us about the things of the Lord. And then somewhere along the line, we gain a little bit of belief in what they're saying. It's called faith. And then we want to do something, like the, the lady said in their testimony, you get to the point where you repent. The word repent means you turn away from whatever life you're living. could be religious or non-religious, and you turn towards the Lord. And then he says, bury your old way of life, the Bible says, and you get baptised. By the way, if anybody wants to get baptised today, we've got everything here for you. And we won't be just sprinkling a little bit of water on your forehead because that is unscriptural. The way they got baptised in the Bible was right under the water, what we call immersion. And that can happen today if anybody would like to. And then it talks about being filled with the Holy Ghost. And the way you know that you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in other tongues. And it's another whole subject which I haven't got time to go through today. But just so that that's in your mind while we're going through these things, if you wanted to come to the Lord and you haven't done that yet, you can. So let's turn to another scripture, this time to Joel. <clears throat> and just chapter 2. And this is the great chapter that uh, the Apostle Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. We'll just start though in verse 23. <clears throat> where the Lord prophesies here, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overthrow with, overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army which I send among you. There's a lot more there. All, or the main point I want to get out of it is that, there, again, it refers to two different times. It talks about a former rain and a second rain, a latter rain. And uh, without going into a lot of Bible prophecy, we do believe we're living in the time of the latter rain. Former rain, of course, was when Christianity came to the earth 2,000 years ago th through Jesus Christ. And the great revival that broke out from Jerusalem and went on, on one day there, recorded in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, 120 people that had walked with Jesus for three and a half years received the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues. And that was the beginning of the church. And what we do know is that from that time on, the gospel was preached to mankind. And here it says that um, things are going to get better. Things that in your life where the canker worm and the caterpillars have eaten are going to all be restored. Life's going to be good. And you're going to find peace and joy and health in your life. Let's turn to another scripture, to Habakkuk. Making you look a bit difficult scriptures to find, I know. Just in chapter 2 there, in verse 1, only a little prophecy, a little book of prophecy, this one. I don't know how little Habakkuk was, but his prophecy is fairly short. And we're just going to pick it up in chapter 2 and verse 1. And I'll stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch thee 
what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or directed, instructed. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tables that they that he may run that readeth it. In other words, be moved by what he hears or she hears. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. When you look back on the history, very briefly, of Christianity, it started off with a roar, which the Bible described there before as the form of rain. And then, and then it went downhill and we came into what we call the Dark Ages when religion turned away from the Bible and unfortunately a lot of paganism crept into Christianity. And uh, we know there for hundreds of years the simple truth of the Word of God was not there. One of the most difficult things was people didn't have a Bible. It was written in either Hebrew or Greek and they didn't speak those. And the, uh, the only other language was Latin. And people didn't speak Latin either, or eventually they didn't. And then it was, as you know, a few hundred years ago, that all of a sudden people dared to, under great persecution, to translate the Bible into English. We know that happened a lot with people like William Tyndale. And then, of course, in Germany, um, Martin Luther. And all these people started to put the, the Bible in a language that people could read. And so um, we just know there that uh, all that wonderful, all those wonderful things happen. So he's saying here, though, uh, we'll just read verse 3 again. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. I dare say what we could say is for this time, the time of Christianity um, and the, what we might call the end of that time also. But at the end it shall speak, the prophecy will stand up. And, uh, but he does say here, make sure you're there when it happens. And then he says, For behold, his soul which is lifted up uh, is not, uh, start again, which is lifted up is not, or proud, not upright in him. And then it says, But the just shall live by faith, which is one of the great statements from the Old Testament. And particularly prophesying that under Christianity it was going to be different. Because under the Old Testament it was the law and the commandments and then he said the New Testament is going to be a different way of living. You will live by faith. This verse must be very important because it was quote, re-quoted three times in the New Testament. That's how, many, how obviously it was important. The just shall live by faith. Uh, let's have a look in, uh, let's Go to the New Testament, to uh, Luke chapter 12. So Luke chapter 12, and actually we're only going to read one verse in this big chapter. He's talking about the signs of the times and how that they could discern the weather. They could say, you know, if you look at the sky, we're pretty sure tomorrow will be hot and and the rain, you got all this, you're good at doing that. Of course, these days, with modern computers and so on, they can predict what the weather's going to be incredibly accurately by in about uh, a week or two weeks' time, maybe more. And you, how can they know what? I dare say it's because all the information goes into the computer and it works it all out and says, if you've got this sort of weather, blah, blah, you will have this in a week's time. At, uh, on that day, it's going to be this temperature, and often with, within a degree, isn't it amazing? Well, anyhow, back then they didn't have that, but they, particularly the farmers, could do, look at it. He said, you're really good at being able to discern the time, but then he said here, in verse 56, you hypocrites, or double standard people, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? And I just say my point today is this time is important to us. We can't do anything about the past. We can't do anything. And I just say the future is, is the future, but we can do something now. And we need to at least discern this time. I think the first thing to realise is that we have an open book, a Bible we can read and understand. But we don't normally appreciate it until one day somebody says, that's the book of life. That's got all the answers you need. Whatever you're going through, that book has got the answer. You might think it's an old-fashioned book, which in one sense it is, thousands of years old. But being written by God, which we believe it was, yeah, people wrote it, but they were inspired by God when they wrote it. 
It, it covers all ages, all societies. This book really has got the answer. So uh, about 100 years ago, and just very briefly, we had the first sort of major outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some people would have heard of the Azusa Street Revival and a lot of others that broke out. And over the last 100 plus years, there has been great revival where people, millions of people getting baptised and spirit-filled. But just the same, there's still a vast majority of people are still unsaved or unaware of what the Bible says. Orthodoxy, the old traditional church like I was brought up in the Church of England, those, they have sort of let other stuff come in and left out the good stuff. And then fortunately, like in 60 years ago, I heard the full gospel. Somebody said, like on baptism, christening as a, ba in a, as a baby is not in the book. But getting baptised as an adult, your decision, whether you want to get baptised, the ball's in your court. And of course, praise the Lord, eventually it took me a while. I got baptised, I got filled with the Spirit. And then the whole Bible, as one of our sisters said, it became a new book. Re read it through the eyes of the Holy Spirit is wonderful. So we need to discern this time. And maybe for anybody here today that hasn't yet come to the Lord, maybe you could say to yourself, this is not by chance that I'm here today. This is not by chance that I'm hearing uh, the way of truth and, and what to do to get saved. Let's have a look in, um, in the book of Acts now in chapter 3. Now in chapter, no, I won't do that. I'll go back. Sorry about this. Let's go back to chapter 2 because we have talked about it and we should really maybe just have a quick read of that. So this is uh, Acts chapter 2, what I've already mentioned a couple of times, the day that people got filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues or other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is a miracle. It's not a language you learn. If you, if you know a dozen languages, I'll guarantee when you receive the Holy Spirit, it will not be one of them. This is from the Holy Spirit. And without speaking in tongues, I dare to say we would not have Christianity. This is how Christianity started. This is 50 years after the, uh, the day Jesus died on the cross at the Passover. And on the past, he became the Passover lamb. And 50 days later, 12 apostles and others all received the Holy Spirit. Now the good news to me and the good news for you hopefully too is that that is still, still here, still happening. Nothing's changed. Okay, go back to where I was. Sorry about this. Keeps dropping out. I don't normally preach from one of these, but I decided to try it out. Not so good. Give me a Bible. Just I've been traveling, traveling light, and my Bible's fairly heavy. Anyhow, let's keep going. Let's go to chapter 3, as I said. And just uh, reading in, um, in verse 18. Paul, the Apostle Peter encouraging people to come to the Lord. So I'd just start reading in verse 18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of his prophets, we've just read some of that from the Old Testament, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So I want to maybe particularly think on that, the times of refreshing. Well, we are living in times of refreshing. We're living in a time when I believe there's a bit of a surge back towards God. Atheism sort of really prevailed, I believe, in recent times. But I think there is a... I know where most, most people in our fellowship uh, have connections now to the rest of our fellowship for years... The only thing you'd ever know about our fellowship in London, or, and we have got all over the world, by the way, would be if uh, somebody had been there or came into our meeting there, and uh, we um, would relay it. But now we have this thing called WhatsApp. 
Who's got WhatsApp? Have you got a local WhatsApp for the Gold Coast Fellowship? Ooh. Well, some of the fellowships have a local WhatsApp and they, I particularly think of some of the revival we've been having in Geelong and in Launceston and, and, uh, and so on. What happens there is on WhatsApp, they, um, it, it goes daily. Whereas once you'd sort of go from Sunday to Wednesday night, and Wednesday night maybe a young person to Saturday, but in between not much contact, through this thing called WhatsApp, people are communicating every day. And little things, little testimonies, and I need a bit of prayer for this, and it's quite an amazing thing. So I guess that my point is that the times that we're living in now are changing all the time. One amazing thing that happened through dear old COVID was we got this thing called Zoom. And uh, that, can talk about come at the right moment, that when we were stranded at home, we could still tee in and, and listen to talks and so on. So they are amazing times. I believe this is a time of refreshing. And like uh, Habakkuk said, you've got to wait for it, be there when it breaks through. And I've I got a feeling that maybe around the corner, particularly with the world, the mess that it's in, and more and more people being nervous about what's happening, who better to turn to than to God? Um, just read on here a little bit further. Um, verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So there's a big jump here from 2,000 years ago in verse 19 to verse 20, something that's not yet happened. One day Jesus is going to come again. In verse 21, Whom the world must receive, until the times of the rest of restitution. So back in verse 19, we had the times of refreshing. In verse 20, we have the times of restitution, um, uh, when things are brought back to the Lord, which God had spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. So my thought here today in particular is that we found the truth and we should hang on to it. Going back to the story of Esther, where Mordecai said to Esther that if we don't step up to the plate, God will bypass us and he will raise somebody else up. He will still deliver, but it won't help us too much. We'll end up not benefiting or so on. And maybe when we're in the church and in the, in the great full gospel message, we want to make sure that God, and, and there's no problem here, but you can easily see over the last 2,000 years that many revivals spread up and eventually faded out. We don't want to be in that category. We're a Holy Ghost church. Revival is one of our names. We believe in reviving the Bible truth so that people can come, uh, come to the Lord. So we look at the fact that God is working with us and that uh, we want him to keep on working with us. We want to be like Esther, be there at the right moment. For such a time as this, we're here to preach the gospel. Let's have a look at another scripture, this time in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, and we'll just go to chapter 5, and we'll go to verse 14. Wherefore he saith, this is the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at uh, Ephesus, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Not talking literally. These are people that are walking with the Lord, but they've gone into a bit of a slumber, gone into a bit of a backwater, nothing much greatly happening. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Boy, if that ever applied then, does it apply now? The redeeming mean we buy it back. Like if you, you go to a pawnbroker and you put in your grandfather's clock or something, well, one day you want to get back, you've got to go back and you redeem it. You buy it back, that's where the, what the word means. So we're here to redeem time, to bring time, to make time important right here and now. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And... Without any hesitation, the will of the Lord is that the gospel goes to this world. The last couple of words that Jesus said, Mark 16, go you into all the world and preach the gospel, means the good news to, to, all, to every creature. Matthew chapter 28, baptizing people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
teaching them all things that I've instructed you. That is still the will of God. When you get saved, you might be thinking, no, no problem with that. You're thinking about yourself. I want to get saved. I want to get baptised. I want to get filled. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God, what's God thinking? Yeah, I'm going to save you that you can save somebody else. God's already thinking ahead. We become saved. We've got a testimony. And it's not long, usually within a day, so we talk to somebody, might be a friend, a relative, a workmate, a schoolmate, whatever it is. So that's how the, the gospel goes out. And by the way, there's nothing more exciting than somebody that has just come to the Lord. Maybe sometimes we talk about walking where angels fear to tread. Well, that's a good thing. Later on, I think we become too wise. But often when we first come to the Lord, we're just full of it. And we want to tell everybody, which is very exciting. Verse 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So we don't get filled with the, the W, what is it, BWS Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to be drunk, be drunk in the Holy Ghost, not in the, the, the natural one. And speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's go to uh, Romans 13. Romans 13, just in verse 10. L Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So I just say, particularly talking to people who are already baptised and spirit-filled, and again the thought on, on, on what time we're living in, it is high time to be awake and vigilant. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Before we get saved, maybe we're not even aware of it, we tend to walk in darkness. Maybe another word is ignorance. We don't know what it's all about. We don't understand the world we're in. We don't know, really look at history. What does that mean? We don't know where we are now. We don't know what's around the corner. But when you come to the Lord and you get filled with the Holy Ghost, your eyes are open. You see things through spirit-filled eyes. All of a sudden, life makes sense. And by the way, I will say right here and now, don't get baptised just for the moment. It's a whole new life. It's, a whole, it's, it's an ongoing life. It's not just, I've done that, I'm okay, I'll go back to what I was doing. No, the Lord brings you into the church, into the body of Christ, into a thing called fellowship, where you rub shoulders with other people that have also been saved. Verse 13 says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lust thereof. So, in other words, we move into a new era. First of all, we often look at ourselves and think, I can't do that. I've tried that. I, I, can't. I wanted to have a, like a New Year resolution. I'll never keep it. It doesn't even last one day. But when you come to the Lord, the Lord puts the Holy Ghost in you and you have the power of God within you. And what you thought you couldn't do, suddenly you find out you can do because the Lord has come into your life. Uh, let's go to uh, John chapter 6. The Gospel of John chapter 6. And just, first of all, one verse and then we'll jump down to some other verses. Just in verse 56 it says, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. On face value, that sounds dreadful. Sounds like cannibalism. He was talking that later on when we take the communion, which we will do here today, that we take a little bit of biscuit, which represents the Lord's broken body. We take a little bit of, uh, of uh, the grape juice and that represents the blood. But on its face value, it was sort of a statement like, what is that about? What can he possibly mean? It just says, in, jump to verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying or an impossible saying, who can bear it? 
When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? I think maybe for those in the Lord, often this can be the case, where something comes along and unsettles our walk in the Lord, and the Lord sort of sidles up along and says, Does this offend you? Is this it? You've come to this point, but now something's, you know, you can't get over this hurdle. And that's how you sort of just said, you know, he didn't, he didn't say, oh, by the way, stop, stop, I'll explain things. Please wait. He didn't do that, did he? He just put it back to them and said, you misunderstand, and therefore, is this it? You're going to walk away, which they did, unfortunately. In verse, um, uh, verse 62, and what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Well, some of those disciples walked away, and the what and the if never happened. They were not there a few months, years later, whatever it was, when the Lord ascended, out, ascended back. They went there. He said, if you hang around, you'll get to know what I'm talking about. All right, which um, we'll just keep on reading. For the Spirit, it is the Spirit that quickeneth or giveth life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there be some of you... Um, uh, there'll be some of you that believe not. Uh, let me jump down a bit further. From that time, many of his disciples went back, and then we see there he asked the twelve who are still with him. In verse 67, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The way he answered was, I also have no idea what you're talking about when well, you're talking about eating your body, but all we're convinced is that you've got the answer. And later on, because they stayed and waited, then all the revelation came to what the Lord was talking about, that through his sacrifice, we now have eternal life. And uh, Peter gave that perfect answer. I, I, I basically, well, we can't go. There's nowhere else to go. We're hanging in with you. Let's have a look in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And just there in verse 6. Uh, well, I made a mistake here. Go back. And then verse 6. Just verse, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his de deeds to them that patient, who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immorality eternal life. So just one little point out of it. I just want to grab a couple of words there in verse 7. Patient continuance. That's how you become a born-again Christian and live for the Lord. You've got to have that thing called patient continuance, continuing on. Because there will be challenges like there are for all of us. Things won't always go perfectly. You know, sometimes I've had people say, what would happen, you know, if this went wrong? Would you still believe in God? I'd believe in God more. I'd rather go through some drama with the Lord than without the Lord. You know, the, the thought of, of going all the things that can happen in life. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, and we'll just look at one more verse after that. Okay, Colossians chapter 4, and just one verse here, verse 17, to a guy called Archippus. By the way, if there's any young mothers here that are having difficulty on naming your next child, there's a nice Bible name, Archippus. I tell you what, we'll never forget that name of that child. And here there was a guy who had to live with a name like that. I say to Archippus, who is a brother in the Lord, by the way, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that thou fulfil it. I just say, just the, my thought is that from the day we get saved, we have all got a ministry to represent the Lord. First of all, as I said, maybe to our friends, our relatives, workmates, schoolmates and so on, or somebody we maybe have never met, doesn't matter. We have a ministry. Let's keep going, brethren. Let's fulfil it. And we're going to finish right now in 2 Timothy and chapter 4.
well-known passage, verse 1. Now this is the Apostle Paul just before he went before Nero, the emperor at the time in Rome, and they believe that just shortly after this, Nero had him executed. Amazing guy of the Apostle Paul, when you think of what he went through and he got beaten and stoned and all the things he went through. And in this particular chapter, I won't read it all, you can read it later, he signs off, you might say. He signs off, I've done, I've done all I can do, I'm now ready, I'm heading out. And he was. But just before he, he said that, chapter, two, chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season. In other words, be constant, like we just read a minute ago. Instant, in season and out of season. Don't change. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, all persistence and doctrine. It says, for the time will come. I don't want to change the word of God. You're not allowed to do that. But I do wonder if we could say, for the time has come. This is the time that or we have to deal with anyhow. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Unfortunately, there's a lot of fable out there in the name of religion. You'll even have people on some of the things I've talked about today, like water baptism and the Holy Spirit, where they're, they're saying... Um, you don't need to do that. Don't ever listen to anybody that says that. If they mention something like being baptised and they say it's not necessary or it's not important, they are taking a big risk. We should never ever look at something like the Word of God and say it's not important. It is very important. All of it's very important. Um, in verse 4, they'll turn their... They shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned unto fable. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And all the people said, Amen. Hand back to Pastor Tim. Okay, thanks, Pastor.